Welcome to everyone uh, to this BAFTA Guru live session on factual storytelling in TV. Thank you to everyone out there who, oh God, I hope I didn't jump in too soon. What do you think guys? I'll say welcome again. Welcome again to this BAFTA Guru live session, factual telling in storytelling in factual TV. Thank you to everyone out there in the Zoom sphere for joining us. Um, I've got a brief bit of housekeeping. Um, there are closed captions available and please post any questions in the Q&A box. We will come to those at the end of the session and we will try and answer as many of them as we can. Um, first off, I'd like to introduce you to today's panel. Um, when I introduce you, can you give everyone a wave so they can see who you are? Um, first of all, we've got Yemi Bamiro, who is the director of One Man and His Shoes and TV's Black Renaissance, Reggie Yates in Hollywood. We also have Stephen Day, uh, who is an executive producer and his credits include Race Across the World and 999 What's Your Emergency. We've got uh, Dan Dewsbury, who is another director and his credits include The Mighty Red Car and Life and, De Life and Birth. Um, and we have Claire Hughes and uh, she's an executive producer and her credits include Jesse Nelson, Odd One Out and Conviction, Murder in Suburbia. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have an initial group discussion where we're going to try not to all talk over each other in terrible Zoom etiquette, but have a free flowing conversation covering the skills you need as a storyteller and creative collaborator and then go on to discuss contributors and their importance in the, the, um, the narrative structure of Factual and how they can uh, help with the storytelling devices. Then we will delve into key projects for each of our panel, panel uh, so, and the storytelling techniques they used in each of those. So for Yemi, we're gonna look at, um, discuss one man and his shoes. Stephen, we're gonna discuss Race Across the World. Dan, we're going to talk about life and birth, and Claire, we're going to talk about the Jesse Nelson doc. So firstly, um, I think what would be great to start with is how do you identify a good story that is worthy of being told? Um, Yemi, do you want to start us off and tell us about how you first identified the story of one man in his shoes? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I think in relation to one man in his shoes, I started thinking about this story a long time ago. I would I want to say like seven years ago and I was thinking about stories that I thought that first and foremost that I, I could live with for a long time because I knew that I wanted to make a, a long form documentary and I knew that you know someone wasn't going to miraculously just come along and give me a pot of money so I knew that we would be making a film independently so I was thinking about ideas that I naturally had a fascination with an intrigue with and and also ideas that I could sit with for a long time so you know I wouldn't get bored of an idea after like two years because you know I I, I expected that this film was going to take a long time so yeah I started to think about you know just Air Jordan sneakers and the fact that you know no other sneaker had, has ever really eclipsed from a financial or popular culture perspective, you know, what the Air Jordan is. So yeah, that's pretty much like the origin story of, of, you know, how it formed in my head. I started to think about this sneaker. Then I started to think about, I started to think about, you know, its relationship with Michael Jordan and the, the time in which this all happened, like eighties America was pretty, uh, an interesting place. Nineties America was interesting. Uh, I started to think about, you know, the implication on, uh, you know, athletes endorsing things. Um, I think, you know, you could look at everything that we have now and I think you could always trace it back to sort of what, what Nike did with the Air Jordan. So, I, you know, all of these ideas were percolating for, for, for a number of years. And because we made the film independently, you know, we had the luxury of time whereby we'd make a little bit and then go and do some TV work and then come back to it. And then, you know, so we sort of like had a lot a long time to craft the story so but I think initially yeah I was just interested in this sort of like nostalgic you know really rich more than a sporting story like a cultural story a history story and like a social story um and you know I was, I was interested in all, in all of those elements and, and how we could bring them together and make this you know coherent film about you know some trainers basically 
And did you have any other contenders? Did you think, oh, Air Jordans is interesting, something else is interesting, and then knock the others out? Or did you just, you saw those shoes sort of, because it's such a very sort of micro story that just speaks to such a bigger macro story. It's it, or yeah. you get there quickly and then keep working on it, or did yeah. you? Yeah. No, no, yeah, no, completely. There, there were no other stories, I think, you know. I, I'm not a massive ideas person, so <laughs> if I have an idea, I'm going to hang on to that, and then, I'm, you know, I'm going to obsess about it, and then, you know, I'm going to think, actually, is there something here? And, yeah, thankfully for us, there was, and, yeah, it kind of, like, was this, this seed in my head that just, like, grew and grew and grew, and, and you know, we thankfully were able to tell it in, in, in the way that we eventually did but um yeah it was just this one idea there were no other ideas um so claire with that sort of um i think what yemi's touched on is you know you get an idea and sometimes once you've got that eureka light bulb moment you kind of know that you're on something you know we're living in extraordinary times stories that are worth telling last year in the heart of 2020 just don't feel quite to have the same currency and purchase do they so you know, how fluid do you need to be about subject matter? And as Jimmy says, if you're going to tell a long form story, sometimes that can be quite high risk, can't it? You know, that you've got to, there's got to be a sort of why now to quite a lot of what we do. Yeah, there does. But I think something that brings um, all stories together, you know, in terms of them getting on the telly is that they have to have some form of purpose. And whether that's a relevancy to the time and place that you're living in, or whether it's just a fantastic character whose story, you know, transcends any sort of current affairs or, or pandemic issues or whatever. So I think, you know, I, I always try and start out with the idea that um, you know, for me, I come from quite a different background to Yemen. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I came up through journalism. And so I tend to always just think, well, how can we do this? So very often I've had to do a story because it's important or it's on the agenda or there's a reason. And it's always a case of how. And I think that's, um, you know, always a, a key skill, isn't it? That you can take a subject matter and tell it in a number of different ways. And that depends on the channel you're aiming at or, or the audience that you're going for. And, and, you know, I think that there's always, you know, there's a hundred different ways to tell a story. And so I think that you can react to differing times and differing sort of audiences by adapting the story that you're telling. Um, because I think you can always find things, especially when you have a great character or, you know, a great purpose to a story that you can you can tie into any sort of time or audience. Yeah. Um, Dan, for you, what do, when do you, how do you find your stories that you want to focus on? Do, is it similar to, to Yemi or do you tend to come, do you get given um, projects to make and then you have to decide like the tone or what you're going to do with it? Or is it a mixture of both? It's a mixture of both. I definitely hear what Yemi and Claire are both saying. And I kind of, I guess, in addition to that, the things that I look for are are these places or precincts places of kind of high drama, or um, and and how empathetic do I feel towards the subject matter? It's a little bit like what you're saying, Yemi, in terms of you know how attached am I to 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 the subject? Kind of also gives you an indicator of how how much you're going to put into it and it's um you know like in your case it's a, it's a long time isn't it and um and in in the same case when you're making you know a big series you've got to know that you're going to it's going to be a place where where drama is going to happen where where for want of a better word kind of conflict is 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 going to be inherently in the um and i, I guess also in addition to that is relatability i kind of always say with either to myself or with PDs that I'm working with, um, you've got to try and find the relatable. And, and that, that um, is really important in storytelling um, because if you don't, I guess it's if you don't care, it, what, what makes me care about this subject um, is probably the same as what an audience is always thinking about as well. Um, Stephen, I was just thinking about your two projects that we referenced. Both yeah. of them are what we like to call big returners aren't they you know they've been yeah. had big impact but they have to come back again and again and again and particularly with 999 that's just such a fantastic story engine isn't it and you can tell a million stories through that that sort of that mechanic which is fantastic but again with race around the world do you, when you're looking at ideas are you trying to find ways that you can almost use them as a a great well a story generator and that's um that's the kind of project that i look for both of those series with, um, you know, um, supply that in spades. So I really, um, that's exactly what I'm looking for. That 
it's not so much the story that I'm going after, you know, there's not one idea I've got or passion I've got. It's more looking for a kind of setup or a premise. But within that, um, there's lots of stories to generate and recognize um, and follow if they're good. Mm. You know? um, so it's quite different from everyone else, I think, but that's what I look for. Um, and then within that, I mean, I just think that um, the th first thing about any individual story for me is just, do I want to know more? So um, if I want to know more, um, you know, then it's just that investigative kind of sequence of events that will carry on. And um, you know, then you find out, you know, if, is there a dr drama inherent in this or is there humour, which is, you know, for me, it's ex extremely important to um, get hook an audience in with humour. Um, so they're the kind of things I'm looking for in the story. Um, that was that was on my list was um, was tone. <laughs> it's like once you've right. identified your story in your precinct, it's kind of that that it's the storytelling techniques you needed to be sort of maybe going you know finding the right tone of voice for each project to make sure they speak to that current tale. Do, do you want to um, maybe Claire to speak to that a bit? Yeah, I mean, I think you can always set out with a vision and an idea of what you think a story is going to be, but I think you have to be incredibly flexible because very often it doesn't turn out that way. And, you know, the story that you, you thought you were making has, you know, become something else. Um, so, you know, I think you can set the tone um, quite clearly in terms of filmic style and, and, and all those things. But I think in terms of of tone, you know, you have to be adaptable um, and sort of respond to the story. I mean, I made that series Conviction, uh, Murder in Suburbia, yeah. and that was commissioned um, because it was the story of a, of a man in prison and uh, this charity called Inside Justice were, um, you know, campaigning while they were looking into whether or not it was a miscarriage of justice. And, you know, it was commissioned because it looked as though it could be. But as the as the filming went on, it became apparent that actually it wasn't a miscarriage of justice. And I mean, you know, what commissioner wants that? You know, a story <laughs> of a guilty man who was correctly incarcerated. <laughs> that, that became something that, you know, we very quickly had to think, OK, well, we've got six months of material here, you know, and, and you know, there has to be a story made out of it. And so I think I think, um, you know, you just have to be so adaptable and flexible in terms of your storytelling. Um, I, I remember that film really well. You have the the, the um the presenter, the the uh, Louise Shorter, the, yeah, yeah who has a and you did you did a fantastic job of peeling back the layers so that you kind yeah. of I mean the story became the process journey, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, so the story became the process and the journey and the and the sort of the ups and downs, but it became a very different story to the one we you know we started out filming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, so that would you say it's the best laid plans? But you you sort of plan fail to prepare to fail and fail to prepare but you do have to be very flexible uh, that was one I mean I'd probably come to this with you Stephen in more detail in your section but um, obviously when, when you come back to series two or something yeah. you're, you, you're sort of you've got a sort of set sort of journey to a degree but um, part, part of the fun must be that you can plan it but you also you kind of want things to go wrong but don't want things to go too wrong is that so yeah, I mean, um, in ways across the world, we had things go wrong straight away really quickly, but we planned a lot. And if we hadn't, um, we wouldn't have been able to make either series. I mean, I don't know how much, how much detail you want me to go into now, but I mean, um, episode one of series one, before we'd even really started to um, understand what we were making, um, one of our teams had to go home because um, um, one of the, the contributors' mother was very ill and she was about to die, she did die. And um, yeah, um, we didn't. You know, when we when we left the UK, um, we, and we were aware that she was ill, but and the contributor didn't mind. You know, she, was, she wasn't that worried about it. Um, but it all changed really quickly, um, and so that set the tone really for how and um, that series and what's happened for us over the two series. Um, that's that was going to lead um, quite. Six segue quite perfectly into the in factual you're telling real people stories and our, our relationship with our contributors is really key to that storytelling but with you're sort of hugely privileged to be allowed into people's lives to tell their stories and you know I was thinking particularly Dan maybe you could talk to that with um life and birth is that you're you're in an amazing precinct of a uh mater you know a birthing unit and um but you don't know really what's going to happen and what, what's the process for you with the with those families and some of those births were incredibly um 
sort of perilous did you you know you must you can't really plan for what's going to happen and ha whether those people might no longer want you there telling their story it's very intimate could you talk us through that your process of how that worked that's all to do with um, relationship building that's kind of thanks on on a team uh, like we had on life and birth it's thanks to you know the producers and the ap's and creating those relationships and it goes back to a little bit what we were talking about in terms of kind of empathy when you can understand the key to why a contributor may may or may not want want you there then you can kind of be able to kind of um for one of the word use that to be able to hold on to those relationships when they start to to waver you know you know being at um you know in the middle of a birth is a very very sensitive especially <laughs> someone like myself with a long lens you know kind of is going to be a very very sensitive time um so you have to know when to build the relationship and that that in that type of situation that has to be done very very fast um but also you know you know having those interpersonal skills to kind of be able to do that is a key factor in getting the right stories being able to finesse story and and knowing where those contributors are going uh, how they're going to be thinking is all to do with this this idea of kind of always understanding a your audience but b um the people who you're filming because that will that will allow you to get more and more from them i'm pretty sure everyone would agree with that um, yeah, so uh, Claire, you have obviously a very sensitive um, contributor at the heart of the Jesse Nelson film. Um, I, I'm sure there was a certain amount of access agreed at the beginning, but how did, how did that sort of evolve and develop across the making of the film? And how did you manage, manage to, I mean, because it was incredible access to her family. How did you manage that? Yeah, well, the, the director of the film was a very good friend of Jessie's, actually, and had worked with her for a number of years, and it was him who brought the access. So, you know, she, there was already in place a very trusted relationship, and she trusted him. Um, and, you know, he was able to get, you know, this amazing access to an incredible story, and I don't think she would have told it to anyone else. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as the, the project went on then, you know, when it got it got into the edit, um, you know, there were times when my job was to, you know, sort of point out that the film might be better if some of the things that maybe they didn't particularly like and that made them both a bit uncomfortable were in. And that that's, you know, there's always a bit of a creative tension there because I guess, you know, whose story is it? Who owns the story? Is it Jessie's story because she's given the access or is it the BBC's because they've commissioned it? And, you know, my job was to sort of try and cut through and, and manage both of those, to be honest, yeah. and to try and, and help get the best possible story, which sometimes wasn't necessarily, you know, the, the most, you know, the, 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 the scene or the, the bit that Jesse wanted in. Um, you know, we can maybe talk about it a bit more later in terms of the detail yeah. of the programme, but um, yeah, that, the, the team obviously did a great job of, of bringing her through the process. Um uh, Yemi, with your film, you're, you've got, I, I always look at films like yours and wonder what comes first, the access, the interviews, and what order do you do your master interviews? Um, how you, It's a long form project. How quickly did you cast your talking heads? Um, did you, how, you know, how, how long were those drawn out? Did you do a lot of them at the end once you knew what you needed to glue it together? Hmm. Um, um, do that process. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. I think um, we had a wish list of, of contributors when we started the project in like uh, 2013. So I kind of like wrote down a number of dream contributors and yeah, we sort of just set about to get them. I think with a story like this, because it's, you know, a part of a lot of this story is about, you know, the phenomenon of Michael Jordan. So I think my first port of call was to sort of uh, talk to his biographer. Um, and he, he, you know, his biographer ended up in the film and, you know, he'd written probably the most definitive text on, on Michael Jordan, a book called The Life. And he interviewed everyone in, 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 in that book. You know, that book's like the Bible, it's huge. And um, I think once I'd sort of like, you know, interviewed him and, you know, he'd got a kind of like a feel for me, like, you know, he was happy to sort of like help me introduce you know, to other contributors. And that's sort of like how it worked. I think, you know, because all the, the whole films set in America, all American contributors and about a very specific subject, it was a lot about, okay, 
um, I'll happy, I'll, you know, I'll happily do your interview, but who else have you got? You know, and, and I think that's, it was like that a lot. So I think once we'd had, you know, a staple of, of really strong contributors, it, you know, it was pretty easy to get everybody else on. But then also we had the luxury of time. So, you know, there's a guy in the film called Sonny Vaquero and his claim to fame is that, you know, he introduced Nike to Michael Jordan and basically said like, this guy is going to be, you know, you know, the next, the second coming, you like, you need, you need to endorse him. And, you know, Sonny, it took almost two years for Sonny to get in the film, but I just would, I would just email him every six months and just see if he changed his mind. And I, you know, I think he got annoyed with me and I think we ended up interviewing him twice over the course of, you know, the, the last two years of the film. So yeah, it was, it's, it's like, you know, like Dan said, it's, it's relationship building. It's sort of, you know, I where think, did, where did um, Joshua Wood's family come in the process? Did you, they come late? No, so so Joshua Wood's family, they, they came early on because I knew that the film, you know, would have to sort of explore the darker side of the, the shoe's legacy. Um, so I was always um, interested in, 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 in exploring that in a quite, you know, a coherent and quite, you know, serious way. And I think I read about uh, Daisy Williams um, in a paper here. I think it might have been The Guardian and the fact that, you know, her her son had been unfortunately gunned down for a pair of, of, of these trainers. And I think she was in, you know, the time that I had met her, the trial for her son's killers hadn't taken place. And she was very much in sort of like, you know, she wanted to publicize this because it was such a senseless murder and, and these crimes had been happening for a long time. So she was, you know, more than happy to talk to me. And she was a little bit, you know, just her, her mind was blown that, you know, the story had reached this far afield because you know th these things happen all the time but they're normally like national news in america like or local news sorry but this story was national news and then international news because i read it in the paper here so i think she was more than more than happy to sort of like share you know you know this really unfortunate thing that had happened to her son and you know i think we spoke for about six months you know on email and phone and then i i went out to houston to start filming with her and filmed with her over the course of three years and they give a massive emotional heft to the story, don't they? So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Stephen, I was just with, with you when you start, you 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 get your idea. It's a brilliant format, but then you have a casting brief. How did how does that work when you send your t casting team out to to get your contributors? Because those relationships are so key to the. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have to group. give credit to Studio Lambert for part of that because they've got such an amazing casting set up. I mean, you don't have to watch um, Gogglebox to know that. They have a, a, a brilliant um, you know, set up for, for building relationships and I can come in a little bit later. But I, I mean, I have a specific, I think we all were with the BBC with um, Race Across the World about, um, it took a little while to, for us to realise this, but we realised we're not just trying to get a bunch of people that are good telly. We, we wanted them to be, we wanted them to have something at stake. Um, in their lives, in their real lives, because they're going on such a long journey. We just knew that that, that, that journey was going to affect them. So if they had um, something at stake, you know, there's going to be more for us to explore. So that's one area that we really, really were very looking for. And um, Darren and Alex in series one, the father and son who were estranged and wanted to rebuild their relationship is the really, is the best example of that, I think. Um, but also we wanted them to have um, layers because we're working across six episodes in series one um, and eight episodes in series two that, that's a lot of screen time for um, I mean it's, it's at the beginning it's five couples um, but it goes down to four couples quite quickly so um, a lot of screen time um, for those there's no there's no presenter there's no like you know there's no one commenting on what they're doing so they've got a whole lot of screen time so we need a lot of layers to their story um, Joe, um, Joe and Sam in series two are the a really good example of that. That's a, a mother and son. Um, and even though that, what they had at stake was a bit smaller in, in a way that um, he wanted to, um, she wanted to kind of look after him in his first steps traveling so that one day he'd be able to go on his own. Um, but they had so much more than that um, in their relationship that Sam had been adopted when he was um, like 18 months. Um, he had ADHD and problems. And there's, you know, there's this story that there's so many hooks for, and that we wanted to run across. You know, the series we knew that could give us so much material, um, and they were, and both of them were so generous with that. 
and obviously how the race was going to then impact on 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 those factors um, was just like well it's too good a chance to miss really they were fantastic contributors love them I'm muted, sorry. Um, uh, so we're going to talk in a bit more depth, uh, Stephen, about Race Across the World now, if you don't mind. Um, obviously, uh, I, was, I was just looking at your pre-titles again today and how fantastically epic yes. it feels. And um, maybe do you want to sort of talk about that approach that you're on the one hand, you're sort of, it, there's such scale to the series, but there's also incredible intimacy and it's the marrying yeah. of those two elements in the storytelling is really, really um, interesting. I mean, the BBC really wanted to scale right from the beginning. And, and when you can't commission six episodes, and we know we're going to, um, you know, the, they, um, it takes 50 days for them to get from um, London to Singapore. That, that's uh, there's obviously already huge scale inherent in that. But um, scale doesn't really mean anything without the context of the, of the people, but given that, given that sense of like huge scale. And I think that. Um, the, the real crucial thing for us was like giving them agency in, in the process that as much as possible. And the more you believed in their journey, the more epic it became. So um, I, I think that I'm, I'm not sure, I think, maybe Patrick Holland, who's um, controller of BBC Two at the beginning and said he wanted it to run off the rails, to appear as it was going to run off the rails, this series. And, um, I, and that really like stuck with us. And so everything we did that was to try and make the, um, the series feel like it wasn't running down a kind of normal fact 10, um, you know, they get a choice to do this or that or move forward, that, that actually they could make any decisions. You know, they, they, all they have to do, all we, we really put in place was with limited budget, the kind of bones, and at the end of each episode, they need to get to a checkpoint, a different checkpoint. That's all we want, it's quite a very soft format. So every decision that they make is, is, you know, they could go anywhere virtually within like say kind of, they can't go to, into Iran or something, you know, but like at that time, but, um, you know, otherwise every, every decision is their own. And I just think that gives it a sense of scale. And it's interesting you say about the, the um, pre titles because it's, it, it's happened to me for both series now is that when we get to that stage and we look at, and we've kind of built a lot of the stories by then to be able to do the pre titles and, I, and, I, and I'm always like, Oh my God! They did go on an incredible journey, didn't they? Um, and we just we just see it, in that, and it is. I mean, it's a you know this huge in that sense for, for, for the individuals. It's huge. It's not just about um, big pictures, which is an important part, but it's it's about like them. Well, they go on a journey. It's a race, but they go on a journey, and that's the important bit. So I can't hear. From Musica. So with your team, um, when sort of before you send your team out, just uh, do you have like a, a, a shooting Bible of the different kind of ways you want them to shoot things to so because everyone's off doing their own thing, so they all marry together and you get the sort of GVs for the sense of um Yeah, yeah. So um yeah. the way that we constructed the teams, we have several teams, was um so that we could kind of um, represent that running off the rails thing as, 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 as good as possible and get the sense of epic scale with the, with the GVs and things like that. So um, we have embed teams um, that are responsible for shooting GVs as well. Um, I mean, like they're, they're so amazing, these teams, that they live that, that, that journey with them. Um, I mean, they're the one, they have to change their pants on the bus, you know, on an all-night bus and things like that. Just they do live it, and yet they're still having to get do all this extra stuff and get all these GVs. And I'm asking if they got them, and you know, um, and they're very good at. You know, they do do the pretty ones, the kind of picture postcard ones, but they're really good at those ones that um, making um, ugly beautiful, like making it really, really so we can smell what's going on and those kind of things, which I really like. So there's those the embeds, and also they have to be flexible. The the APs, so it's a. Um, uh, PD and an AP, the APs can shoot. I mean, they often have to shoot, especially if the team split up. And um, following them, um, we have often there's a fixer, but there's also um, a, a data wrangler. And the number of times they have to pick up cameras as well, particularly it's like if, they, if they're jumping on a bus, um, if the teams are jumping on a bus, then it's like it's a data wrangler's job. 
or if they're if they're hitchhiking or it's like data wranglers in the follow vehicle gets them up and past and things like that so the whole journey is being represented um, really close in but then the other teams we've got following a week behind um the, the actual contributors um we have a GV team, it's a DOP basically. And we have to try to identify, he can only go one route, but um, we identify um, the bigger stories and send him um, to, to those. And he, often he can drone and give us a, a big setup. Um, and then we have a checkpoint team. So that's another area that um, where we um, get a big sense of um, scale is the run in, so we call it the run route into the checkpoints, which we try to design very differently each time. Um, so that they have, a, I don't know, it could be different transport or one that comes to mind is where they have to race along the beach or get in a canoe on um, Ida Grande in Brazil and to get to the last bit. And we've got that, you know, we always know it's gonna be part of the soft format that they've got to do this bit. And we, we, we can plan ahead and we we you know we use we can use drones and things like that to make that look really epic. I mean, obviously for the checkpoints, we choose beautiful locations. So, um, we were talking a bit before about collaborations with characters. That when you yeah. know that you've you've cast your no, I'm unmuted. Um, when you cast those great characters, how do you drip feed those sorts of those reveals to their sort? You know, you've, you've got their geographical sort of journey, but you've also got their emotional journey. Yeah. Um, you kind of, if they're having those conversations, like on the first night. <laughs> you, yeah, well, we have to sometimes, you know, we have to stop or look. I mean, a lot of the stories we do several times over. So, you know, and look for the, exactly the right one. I think I, over a course of 50 days that, that if you build a relationship with them, that they don't mind doing that. But um, what I ask the, the um, embed teams to do before we go is plot out their kind of ideal so that we've got some sense of the stories we want to get get through. And, and even though that plan is almost invariably thrown out, it does give a structure um, and a, kind of basically a checklist so that we don't forget. And things change, and um, but you have to be selective, yeah. I mean, don't blow it. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of um, putting it all up front anyway. I mean, there was a kind of time where I, I remember that backstories would tell everything. Um, and and so and that then you only watch the people with that with that bit of knowledge interacting whatever they're doing. But I I I, I like the idea that you want to you want to find out out more, you know. Um, there's something about them. There's something you know. I think that I, Joe and Sam we found out that he was adopted in episode two. We didn't find out that she had had cancer a number of times. Cancer that episode six, I think. Emon who eventually won it. He, there was always this undergoing undercurrent about him um, and falling out with his family and his, his nephew, um, Jim didn't know what it was. And we didn't really reveal it until episode five. And then we revealed that Iman was married, which he didn't know before. And that was kind of part of the reason. And I think you have to um, be patient, you know, hold, hold, hold your nerve a bit. Yeah. Um, and finally, the, the last thing that I, I know um, we were talking previously with um, the team is that there are always the unexpected, the unexpected, and sometimes you you think you've got this great rolling narrative, and you're chasing after your tail just to keep up with it, and suddenly everything stops. Um, do you want to talk about the the unpredictable nature of some of the drama, like with the uh, Kazakh ferry? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, again, like it, it's all it, in preparation is really really important. So um, we wrecky the the route. So we had two APs do the whole route both times, both series, but say let's talk about the London to um Singapore one. So they 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 did it for real. Um basically we ran it from the office as if um, they were involved in the race and only let them know certain things. And um they got stuck on the ferry um, in, in, um on the Caspian Sea um, going from um, Azerbaijan to Kazakhstan. And um it was we also got them to do diary counters as they went along. And it was on the Kazakh ferry, the diary cam of one of the APs on the third day where he'd lost it. I knew that we had a series. Um, it, it was wonderful. Of course, we didn't know that, they, um, that the teams would actually get stuck. Um, they were actually stuck longer. Um, but it was a common occurrence, so we were, we were ready for that one. Um, actually, that AP as well, he, he was an AP as in one of the embedded teams, and so he got stuck on the ferry again. So he spent about eight days, I think, on, on the Caspian Sea. 
Um, but he was a little bit annoyed the second time because they, they spruced it up a little bit. They gave it a little paint. His body was a bit too posh. But um, but um, that's kind of an example where we you know we kind of knew that was coming and um, it was built into our schedule. Five days was a lot, but so it pushed us at, at really close. But um, in the second series, we couldn't foresee um, some of the, the political events that happened. Or I mean, there were rumblings, but we didn't know how they'd play out. And so Ecuador went into a state of emergency, and teams were already heading to a checkpoint there. So we had to quickly um, find a new checkpoint. Uh, the team that we have in the office that build the kind of, in, um, we have travel guides for them to give them suggested places they might want to go and that. And they, they, they found this place in the Tatakawa Desert. And we had to work out a way um, how, how the team's going to find out. They think they're going to Quito in Ecuador. So we use the trackers that they, um, where they find out about their um, checkpoints for that. Um, but it all had to happen really quickly. I mean, I think we had a, we were in Panama. I, I was in Panama then. And we had to make a decision: are we, we're going to halt the th everything, um, you know, until we can work out what to do, or we're we just going to go for this. And um, we went for it. They were all actually you know, like crossing the Darien Gap at that point um, from Panama into Colombia. And uh, yeah, so we just let, we just let them know, and and it was you know a better story. Yeah. Um, um so finally, just to, uh, do, do, do you have any devices that you could share that you use in the edit that you, you know, you've got to make this go last for, what's it, eight episodes per series? Well, it's for a series two is eight episodes, yeah. yeah which so, I was pretty scared about, to be honest. I thought that was really, that's really that's a lot. It's a lot to keep people coming back for, is it? So do, do you have any little sort of top tips about those, those um, tricks for the hooks and those cliffhangers that you... You sort of know that you've got I mean, to towards those in each episode. I mean, if, if a simple one is um, where we end the episode. Um, often we get like one or two teams into a checkpoint, and um, I mean, I, I, there's often a good place where, say, um, two teams have got onto the island in Ida Grande, but the other two teams have got stuck. So a, a nice, you know, that's a good cliffhanger. They're really annoyed. Well, there's two teams elated to be there. Two teams are annoyed. Um, and then the beginning of the next episode gets a lovely chase of the last of the other two teams to give you a bit of adrenaline at the beginning of the next one. Um, I mean, these are, it's quite a soft format, um, Race Across the World, and they're an actual pleasure, though very hard to edit. Um, and it often it takes a while to find, especially within the central section of the episodes, um, those kind of like things that keep it moving ahead. I mean, the, the journey does, but you've got to, you know, um, it's, it's a tricky one, that. And you just got to keep trying stuff. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, um, Yemi. Um, with your film, it has such a, its own um, sort of visual style and aesthetic. And how I've just been really interested in, with the you know you how soon did you get into the edit? What time did you decide to start linking stories together and get the the um, the particular graphical style? I think and the the split screens and all that. It just feels like it's a very accomplished and very personalized film it's for, it's got to tell it's, it just feels very unique in that way how did, quickly did you decide with those, all those techniques and where did they come from oh thanks that's really kind of you um we knew quite early on that we were going to have sort of like graphics and, and animation and, um, i made a short film which was basically a version of the film in in nine minutes before we made the feature and that was we kind of wanted to use it as a you know as a device to, to get funding and that basically had everything that you see in the feature film in terms of like the visual language so it had all the graphics it had sort of you know the bespoke music it had you know just the pace and, and the en energy and personality so I knew from quite early on that the feature film would have that and and it was you know for no other reason apart from the fact that you know we knew that we weren't going to have we, we weren't going to be able to afford lots of archive footage, even though there's quite a lot in the film. Um, we knew that it would be impossible to clear some of the archive footage that we really wanted. So 
we just came up with the idea of you know animation and sort of like graphics doing some of that heavy lifting that uh, you know archive would have done there's lots of stills in the film and you know it's the same premise um it's really expensive to clear nba footage so we knew you know years in, a, in advance that you know it just wouldn't happen so we had to come up with a different device of how to you know replace that and and, and make it feel as interesting as looking at you know really really good archive footage so that's basically where the, the, the visual language came from that's uh, i have to say it doesn't feel archive light at all so you, you've done a <laughs> fantastic job with that you, how, where, how did you get hold of the archive and and how did you find it because it, it is um, part of what you've got and also i think there's some really playful bits that you've got that sort of to tell the bigger sort of cultural story. Yeah, I think just years and years and years of going down rabbit holes on YouTube and uh, just finding loads of crazy stuff. I think this film had about three or four archive producers over, over the years. And, you know, those guys were, you know, worth their weight in gold. And then also, I think we knew from really early on that we would need sort of like, you know, a, a good lawyer that understood sort of like, you know, archive laws, not just in the UK, but like in America as well, specifically. So we, yeah, we had people on really early to sort of advise us, like the, the little bit of money that we did have in the beginning just went all on our lawyers, because I think, you know, our worst nightmare was sort of, you know, making a film with like tons of archive and then just being told that your whole thing is in, illegal. So uh, yeah, we, we knew from pretty early on, you know, how we wanted to sort of like utilize the archive and in terms of sourcing it it was just you know I think YouTube's insane you can just find anything and, and I think I, yeah I just went down many a rabbit hole just looking for stuff and uh, that, yeah that's pretty that's much amazing it. advice that you've got this tiny amount of money that you're eking out but you know that you're a very wise man to know that you <laughs> keep you know keep your your film safe that's yeah, that. yeah. I don't, because I don't it, want to advise that before, but it's very good advice. Yeah, no, I think archive lawyers are worth their weight in gold. And yeah, yeah anyone that wants to make an archive heavy film should consult them first before doing anything. Um, I think what's you, you, what's really interesting about your film, I was watching again and timing it. It's like you, you do the big rug pull sort of about an hour in, don't you? You, mm. you save the big emotional story. You mm. don't it through and it, it's really affecting what hmm. how early did you decide that and did you change it around or did you know that that's what you were going to do yeah I mean we did grapple with that I'm not going to lie we did grapple with it I think you know the the entry point to this film was all always like how can we tell the phenomenon of the Air Jordan sneaker that was the central idea and the central theme so it didn't feel correct or necessary putting you know the third act of the film you know like at the beginning of the film so to speak it, 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 because then you had no context how we got to that place mm -hmm. so the whole idea is to build the film up to sort of like show you you know how incredible this phenomenon is you know how it impacted all types of communities how it penetrated pop culture how it sort of like changed the landscape of everything but this all came at some sort of cost because you know there was this other element that you know perhaps isn't well publicized but does actually happen so it just felt like you know building blocks it felt like you know telling this very linear, linear story and it felt you know I didn't want to revise or rewrite, rewrite history I knew that you know as a filmmaker as and you know it was our duty to sort of like tell this story warts and all you know there were sort of like sneakerheads or basketball fans that would have you know happily have sat and watched an 80 90 minute film about you know just how incredible these trainers were but it just felt like our duty to sort of like explore all the factual elements and and and, and just the, the complete history of the shoe and and unfortunately these senseless crimes and these senseless, senseless murders are just something that come hand in hand with you know the legacy of, of, of this of this sneaker so and um with you know the big obvious that person character that's not there is um michael jordan did you ever ever consider trying to approach him did you approach him or did you go no this is the this is the, the film about his relationship yeah. with the sneaker that he isn't going to be in was that a you yeah yeah I always knew it you know it, it's not a, it's not a 
it's not a story about Michael Jordan per se. It's a, it's a story about Michael Jordan's trainers and, and everything that surrounds that. So, and I think that, you know, if you have Michael Jordan in your film, you don't have Michael Jordan in your film as a talking head. Do you know what I mean? He has to be, <laughs> he has to be the beginning, the middle and the end of your film. So then that, you know, by proxy just changes the whole dynamic of what your film is. So yeah, I never sort of like entertain that and it was never at the forefront of my mind that we would get him. I think the only contributor that we really wanted was Spike Lee and we did try for a long time to get him. But I feel that, you know, he's an Oscar winning, you know, director and he's like really busy and, you know, I'm just a random guy from South London. So like, you know, he's not necessarily <laughs> gonna be like, yeah, I'll come and be in your documentary. Um, so yeah, we tried, but I, I feel that Spike has a presence in the film. I, I don't necessarily feel that you miss him massively. You, you understand his contribution. You understand, you know, how seminal he was and how integral he was, should I say, to, to, to this phenomenon. And, and, you know, how incredible those early, you know, uh, commercials and those adverts that he, he made with Michael Jordan I think you feel all of that so I don't necessarily think that you know we miss him that much. There was a massive nostalgia spike seeing all those clips from She's Gotta Have It I haven't watched that film for years but I was like oh I've got to go back and watch that again it's it's um it hit that 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 irreverent delightful tone that he had obviously had a complete massive impact on that ad campaign. Yeah yeah I, I could I, you know I've said this before and I could argue that you know, as, as as instrumental as Michael Jordan was to this phenomenon, I could argue, you, you could argue that Spike was as well. You know, I think that those commercials were, you know, groundbreaking for what they were. And like, if you look at those commercials, like Michael Jordan doesn't really do, do much. It's all it's all Spike Lee and, and the character that he plays in, in those commercials and, and, you know, how enthusiastic and how, you know, giddy he is about the Air Jordan sneakers. And then obviously, you know, him putting those sneakers in his early films, you know, it was, it was part of the groundswell that made, you know, this phenomenon what it, what it is today. Um, and so in, in the end, when you've got a project that takes this long to pull together, how, how long were you actually in the edit? It's a really good question. God, um, I don't know. We we cut this. So Michael, uh, the editor, he uh, he doesn't live there anymore, but he has a basement flat in Victoria Park, and it has no it had no windows, and and, and that's where we basically cut the film. And uh, yeah, I don't know, like years, years. But like it wouldn't. It, the way that we made this film is that you know, we all work in TV. So we'd go and do a TV job and then we'd sort of like get some money and then we'd go and shoot in America and then we'd have like four weeks in the edit. And, and that's pretty much how we made it over the years. So yeah, I'm, the next time I see him, I'm gonna, you can hear probably know how, how many kind of like weeks that we spent in the edit, but it didn't feel like a long time. Only towards the end of the film, we were meant to launch the film at South by Southwest Festival Film Festival in March. And I think that we had to have a cut for the festival. And so the back end of last year, we were really like, you know, pulling all like nighters to, to get the film, film ready. And that felt long. But I think over the course of the years, you know, doing like three weeks here, or four weeks there, it didn't feel like a long time. And like, you know, this never felt like a, it never felt like work. It, it, it was just like a joy to make this film. I think the hard work was the, the rejection that we had over the years, you know, like funding falling through or like, you know, the, the falsehoods that come with independent filmmaking, that was hard work. But the actual like act of going out and making this film was never a chore. It was always like a massive privilege. It's going to be hard for you now, isn't it? To get, to get over that experience. I don't know. Making telly. <laughs> I know. Um, so when, when did you get to the point when you actually, so you did, you had a sort of final point that you had to get a cut ready? Because if it is your own project, when, when do you end? When do you finally go, that's it, that's a... So, yeah, that's a really good shout. So what we basically did is that uh, we put kind of like... Um, we put a date on ourselves. We, we basically said that we wanted to have a cut of the film ready for uh, the Sundance Film Festival uh, entry. And I think we had to have a cut to them by like December, 2019. Um, and yeah, so we were like, whatever happens, we've, we've got to have a cut there. So we, we had a cut there, we sent it to them. We didn't get into that festival, but yeah, thankfully we got into South by Southwest and you know, they only had a rough cut. So we had to basically, yeah, we had to online the film and, and that took quite a long time because we had to grade it. We had to sort of like 
do the dub and you know just a, a million other things so it felt like a long time in the edit there but yeah we had a really sort of like whatever happened you know we have to have to finish the film a cut of the film a, a pretty good rough cut of the film by you know uh december 2019 and, and that's basically what we put on ourselves brilliant um claire um can you um talk us through how you got involved with the jesse nelson film because i I think you came to it at a slightly different stage in its evolution, is that right? Yeah, so I, I came when most of it had been shot and uh, they were putting it together in the edit. So that was both a challenge and also I think possibly a bit of an advantage because I, I think you know there's always the fresh pair of eyes kind of situation where you come in and you look at this footage that other people have painstakingly and lovingly you know gone and got and you're you know all you have to do is sort of arrange it in the right order um but I think it does give you a different perspective on things um and you know a lot of you know I mean everything they filmed ended up in the film but there were a lot of creative discussions around the order and the way that the story was evolving and was told and I think I think the biggest thing was very much about um I think you know Dan hit on it earlier about relatability and you know Jesse is obviously you know this you know A-list pop star who you know lives a life that you know young girls dream of and that the essence of the story where this sort of young girl's dream turned into a nightmare is is so relatable in lots of ways but we had to sort of work quite hard to make it relatable because she's this pop star and everybody holds her on a pedestal and I think you know that by getting her to realize that her situation was more common than perhaps she had ever thought and get her to go and meet all the, the sort of groups of people um was you know the, the best way to tell it to to show that actually what she was going through wasn't particularly because of her fame or you know all those things that actually other people were going through it as well but I think the great advantage of having someone like Jessie was that obviously because of who she is um, it brought a great audience to the project and a great interest in it and she was able to to tackle a subject in a really accessible way um, so it made it feel less like a difficult watch I think because she was you know so mesmerizing in it and, and she opened up incredibly in terms of her own personal experience and I think there was there was always a bit of a tension between her story and then the bigger story mm. and that was that's sometimes hard to do I think without being very heavy-handed and without having lines of script which say things like and it's not just me or you know we've all used those those lines haven't we to try and sort of you know hey audience you know we're talking about something bigger here so we had to really try and rein that in and you know when I went through a lot of the scenes and a lot of the rushes I ended up sort of putting a lot in that maybe was um, sort of almost, it's what wasn't said. I often felt in scenes that actually told you more about how Jessie felt or how she was reacting. When there's one scene of her and her mom on the sofa and they were talking about um, the X Factor and they were talking about magazines and and what wasn't in the original cut was, was the bit where Jessie's mom says to her, oh, I always think you've worn too much makeup. And there's just a look that Jessie gives to her mom. And you re you know, in that look, it, it, you know, there's so much depth to it because, you know, here's a girl who you know, has been mercilessly bullied and it's made her very, you know, sort of nervous about her appearance. And, and that interaction was uncomfortable for her. Um, and there was also a couple of other things that, you know, because Jessie had been so badly affected by X Factor, she didn't want to watch X Factor footage. So there was no X Factor footage in the first cut. And, and, you know, I said, but we have to show the audience where it started, how it started. And, and I suppose, you know, what I tried to bring to it was a sort of a, a logical storytelling, a more traditional sort of storytelling. Um, because I, I think there was, you know, obviously the production team were so tight and they had come on this journey with Jesse. And I think there was a, you know, a great want and sort of desire to protect her. And obviously we wanted to do that, but at the same time, I felt, you know, in order to make a better film, sometimes she had to, you know, we had to sort of show the scenes where she was a little bit uncomfortable. Um, th yeah, I, th I think if you hadn't had that, it would have, it would have been a big hole. It definitely was, it really hit home how, how early it had started. I mean, it literally, it was almost the minute she was part of that show that there was just a, a point where people just thought it was, open game anyone on the x factor is fair game 
is the impression is that you get from the film and that does make it feel really huge and that we're all part of it yeah. uh, so how did you talk her around to that well you know I mean she you know Jessie is an incredibly creative person and um she wanted to make a film that that would make a difference so it wasn't it wasn't too difficult I have to say you know it, she was generally quite brave about you know things um, I think, you know, there were um, other scenes where she, um, you know, felt that maybe we, you know, she sort of wanted certain things included because they were very important to her. And sometimes there were details which maybe got in the way of the of the storytelling. So there was a little bit of debate, but it comes back to what I was saying earlier. It's, it's a real sort of position of privilege, isn't it, to be able to take somebody's you know, sort of innermost raw feelings and put them on TV. So it has to be a collaborative experience and you have to work with people and it is their story after all. And, um, you know, you can't just come in and sort of say, well, this is my vision of it. You know, that there has to be the two visions. So um, Jessie was luckily very open to the fact that if you explained to her why you felt it would make it a better film. Um, and, you know, again, you know, it wasn't, maybe quite the story arc that everybody wanted. I mean, at the end, we'd have loved to have said, Jessie's now better, look, here's TV, it's all very neat. She's been on this television journey and she wasn't great at the start and now she's better. And of course that didn't happen, you know, because life isn't like that. But she did, you know, learn a lot from her experiences of meeting with people and she did gain a lot from it. And she certainly became more open and talking about things helped her. But at the end, I mean, she says herself, you know, there's still some way to go. Um, and so it, there's that scene you have when I think they're all getting ready for another shoot and that was, I, I just thought that was a really that's a it's a show not tell scene isn't it where you see that she's still hugely struggling with body image and it, it was that a battle to get that in or, and is that sort of what you you're referring to as well I thought it made it a stronger film yeah was that the one in there where they were shooting the pop video yeah 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 and interestingly I mean that was in in lots of different guys is that scene because it's it sort of I think it was in initially as a you know sort of isn't this great you know this is her life it's terribly glamorous but actually when you watched it you realized that you know if you played it at a certain point of the film when you'd got to know her you realized that you know all her anxieties and all her insecurities were still there yeah. um and that she you know was doing her best to be brave and to to say all the right things but actually they were still there yeah. So, yeah, there was a bit of debate about how that would be cut, but never that, you know, it, it was always going to be in there. Yeah, I thought that I really liked that scene. And I think it was, you're absolutely right. It's exactly where it's placed, made it have, if you'd put that early, it would have just. Yeah, like exactly. I, yeah. And I think, you know, in our edit, I'm sure like everybody's edit, you know, it was just post-it notes. And, you know, the, the idea that, you know, one scene, could, what, what if that scene moved there? what would that do to, you know, to the story? And it, sometimes it made such a profound difference in terms of the experience of watching that it was, you know, really, you know, interesting. And there were lots of disagreements or, you know, and the commissioners thought one thing and we thought another. And, and actually in the end, it all sort of ended up in the order that we all wanted it in. Brilliant. Um, so I'm suddenly, really, this has been such a great conversation. It's racing ahead. So I'm just going to have moved to Dan um, now. Sorry that I've been pressing on too long. Um, Dan, you obviously with um, life and birth, it's you're taking on one of those big subjects that has, you know, it's one of the perennials, but that you have the the sort of um, the shadow of 24 hours in any &E and um, one born. Uh, so what was it like when you were first offered this as a, as a precinct to explore? How did you take it on? Because it's one of the big ones, isn't it? People giving birth, you're inherently in a dramatic and emotional situation. How did you make it your own? Yeah, how did I feel about that? I felt scared. If I was <laughs> one born, you know, the spectre of one born is, you know, that's what I thought. That's the reason why I took the job. In the sense that the the challenge is there. It's kind of like you've got that series there, which is so well done and so kind of well finessed. It's, you know, so how do you go? How do you look at it from a different angle? How do you kind of and, and what's your perspective on it? And and that's the challenge probably with a lot of things that we do as directors, you know, you're going into areas, whether that be hospitals, you know, like Stephen was talking about 999 and, you know, kind of those kinds of precincts or police and things like that. So it's all to do with what angle or what perspective that you're coming at, at it with. And, and also a knowledge of the, um, 
the audience in terms of the channel um, and kind of what's expected there. So, so with you know that's it with life and birth. The idea was always kind of what you know the real what does it really take to kind of give to kind of give birth. So if you imagine one born, and to some extent it's kind of twenty four hours in a some kind of kind of warm kind of feeling you know, life and birth had to be much more about kind of what is the reality of that situation. And within that, over time, kind of looking that, you know, the, the series honed in to be, for me at least, to be about the strength of of, of women, really, and, and in, in terms of kind of, you know, and, and the power that, that you know, that they, they must have to kind of to bring new life into the world. And And what also came from that was that if you going back to what I was saying before about empathy, you know, th- one of the biggest things that can happen to you in your life, uh, you know, is giving, giving birth, you know, to, <laughs> to life. And it's really, really important to remember that. And it's really important to kind of not to kind of make that trite uh, and to make that into, you know, an emotional experience as emotional as it is for that person giving, giving birth. So that was kind of the, uh, that's how we kind of went into it and how we went about it really. And, and so you, with the series, you, you had, how many episodes was it in total? Was it six or seven? Six in total, yeah. Yeah, so you, I'm, I'm imagining you've got lots of teams on the ground following lots of stories. How much did you precast? Did you, did you know that there were certain birthing stories that, that were likely to come through? Or was it sort of waiting around, waiting for someone to be? Yeah, that's, that's a difficult <laughs> one because... Like got, sort of, yeah. Sorry, yeah, because we, had, cause we had to kind of start up pretty fast. So it was kind of like, I think it was three weeks before, three or, three or four weeks before. So, you know, we had people who had worked on things like that before who were kind of casting and that would be rolling kind of casting. We also had people on the ground kind of waiting for people to come in. And we just, you know, kind of, we did it, did it, did it like that really. Um, and it, all the same rules apply, applied in terms of casting. Do they have a twinkle in their eye? <laughs> Do they have a good turn of phrase? Um, are they giving birth now? Um, and, and you know, and, and things and things like that. And then you kind of picked up on a good point there in terms of you're right. There was a lot of teams, but one thing that we made sure at the start was, and one thing that I think defines really good series. And when I say series, I don't mean just a single episode of that particular series. I mean series as in like you can watch four or five of them. Is how consistent is. The visual, the, the the visual style. How consistent is the storytelling? How consistently is you know are things covered in, in a way which feels satisfying? And sometimes that's to do with a bit of a, a bible, but also sometimes that's to do with thinking of certain stories can only go certain certain ways within the parameters of kind of what of what you're filming, and so you've got to plan for that. And, you know, and it's a little bit like what Club said before, you know, and you mentioned was if you, you, you can plan and plan and plan and then obviously be flexible enough that you can go to the places that it goes to without it feeling like, oh, we can't go there and things like that. And unfortunately, the environment of maternity um, is, is, that, uh, that it is that environment where you can kind of work it out and... Um, uh, and kind of enjoy that type of storytelling and be ready for it and have teams in place prepared for it um it's it's so it is it's a real roller coaster as well birth isn't it because it's like it's the closest lots of women will come to death in the time of giving also giving life so it's it's inherently it can turn on a dime like i think there's i was just watching episode one again today and the baby the baby's born and it's so blue and you're like you're watching it thinking, I'm sure the baby can't die because they wouldn't be like sucker and filming. But you you do start to your heart's pounding watching it because it's so sort of pure. And that that moment when you're as you're watching that as a as a shooting PD, you must be it's all heart in your mouth moment thinking, when do I drop out and when do I you know that that courage to keep going with it, but being really sensitive to the fact that everyone in the room is is pressing the emergency button. That that felt um that, it's about being, yeah it's about you know like before we were talking about contributors being comfortable with you in the room it's also about you being com- comfortable with contributors and I think you know that links to other documentaries I've done before which are kind of like being brave enough to ask awkward questions which I'm yeah. sure kind of everyone relates to you know kind of and and it's all about you kind of being just as comfortable in that kind of environment um but you're right there was I think in one of the other episodes I think 
you know, a lady stood up and the baby just dropped out. <laughs> and no, no one had ever seen that before, um, especially me, because, you know, I don't have any kids myself. So it was all brand new for me. Um, surprised I didn't faint. Um, but, um, but it's, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're right in, in, in that respect. It's, it's that type of storytelling, I think personally, and I don't know what the other guys think, is to do with anticipation. And it's to do with whether that, a lot of people say you craft that in the edit, but if you're thinking about that on the ground, how do I pull out that moment? How do I make that thing, which might be a very instant thing, you know, a baby drop, <laughs> dropping out, you know, is like, how do I build up to that moment? And you can actually think about that a lot on the ground, which I find that, um, a lot of people forget about nowadays. Usually it's kind of like, oh, just get it all into the edit and we'll kind of work it out then. And actually storytelling starts before you even shot anything, which is all the planning stage. And then while you're shooting, that's the flexible stage of, okay, it might go to kind of this place. And it's constantly thinking, not just about questions, but just about how you, how you visually, it's a visual medium TV. So it's like, how do you visually show those things? Stephen mentioned something really interesting before, which was, you know, kind of how do you get a sense of the smell of the place and how, you know, what, what is that feeling? It's not just about postcard kind of picture pictures. It's kind of like, how do you get the grit? And that is all to do with visualness. And, you know, Claire mentioned before about kind of not, you don't need to hear everything in sync. It's not just oral, you know, it's kind of, you, you need to kind of get a sense of, um, of the feeling that someone's going through and that's how you make something relatable. And that's the, um, and that's what we're trying to do with life and birth. What is the feeling of, you know, what must it be? I often obviously, you know, being a male, like empathized with the, uh, you know, the, the males in that, in that room, because you've got, you can't do anything, you, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's the female journey, <laughs> journey, that part. And all you can do is kind of support. And, you know, that's where you can find sometimes humor that's where you can kind of, you can also kind of, um, you know, think about, go into that person, whether that be monologue or underscoring in terms of, you know, sync with the interviews of just what, what is going on in that person's brain. That's what I, that's what I find really interesting about observational documentaries, as in you, you have the present tense, but you can also get the whole poeticness through your, your master interviews if you're thinking about it on the ground. And with your with the master interviews, were there, <clears throat> um, I was trying to work out mo those are all shot pre birth. No, so yes, so, yes, yeah, so they're all shot pre birth. But I don't know. We made it really difficult for ourselves because we wanted to do the interviews, the the master interviews in the present tense. So we were dragging people who were just about to give birth down to our little pod scenario where we could kind of get them in. And it was like at that moment where I was like, I would just wish I decided that we should just interview them, you know, like down the corridor or something like that, because it was so, <laughs> it was so difficult. And what it gives is kind of that present tenseness that you kind of need, but also, you know, quite rightly, people had bigger things on their mind than a documentary, you know, about birth going on. <laughs> um, there's, there's one final little device I was intrigued by was the the little sort of in in um, transitional interstitial moments of, of all the texting. Mm. Which gave you know what someone's having this really intense birth story but actually they're happening all over the in all the different birthing rooms how how did you capture those and when did you decide to do them was that a, a post sort of thing and yeah the, the digital rig how did that work yeah so that was that was in, that's a good, really good point actually you know these kinds of series they always try and find some kind of you know visual truck you know ambulance is a really good one with the map you know, and it's kind of like, essentially it's just a map of an ambulance going to there, but you can create jeopardy within that. And, and that's the kind of use of that. And with birth, there's literally no point in having a map of a hospital saying that Sheila's in room one and she might get moved to room two. There's no jeopardy or anything interesting or any use for that. And so, but what I noticed and what my, you know, what we noticed as a kind of team was that everyone in hospitals, they're always on their phones. And there's a story going on there because, you know, you're usually only allowed a couple of people in that room and they're informing the grandparents or they're saying something funny like, you know, kind of, you know, I wish you could have McDonald's now or can you get me one? It's sneak me one in and things like that. And so that was a place for humour for us. Yeah. And then it just became quite simply about kind of what is the visual backdrop for that. So we had the outside of the hospital and the text kind of popping up and, and it seemed to kind of do a job. And that's what I learned from that type of series. If you're going to do some kind of, 
you know, overriding kind of, uh, you know, uh, aesthetic, what 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 can what can you do that brings something to it can't just be it you know everyone uses the word organic now it has to be organic and that felt the most organic thing that was happening everyone was on their phones and they were texting someone and so we had to go with that that, that way and, and taking pictures <laughs> you know, like i'm giving birth stop with the pictures <laughs> So exactly everyone's taking photos you know that's it that's an interesting point because all the pds um uh, got given macro lenses as well because the visualness of what, what you think when you look at kind of baby photos they're all done on, by professionals as in professional photographers they're all done on um macro lenses you know because babies look cute like that so every single shot of a baby coming out was done on a macro lens to kind of give that kind of same feeling and that that's what I meant before when I was talking about that consistency. You kind of, you go into that kind of detail because you want to have the audience to have that satisfaction of knowing where it's going. And obviously we all know it's going, it's, you know, baby's going to be born, but you, but there's lots of stuff that can be done to contribute to that as well. Um, guys, we're, we're sort of five minutes off when we were supposed to finish. I've been told by BAFTA that we're allowed to carry on a little bit longer. Shall we go to some questions? Would that be, um, I've got seven, I think, here. So, um, oh, this I, I will ask answer this ask this one first. And I think this is probably for you, Yemi. Before funding is granted, how much spare time should be spent on a story? Actually, this could be for any of us, couldn't it? Uh, so how much time should be spent on a story idea? Are things like research time, emailing, acquiring contributors only begun once funding is gained? That's a very good question. When do when do you when do you not just be a paragraph? When does it become a full development? Um, Stephen, do you want do you, do you, how much are you involved in the development process? And could you speak to that? Normally, I mean, development has come some way along, and then I you know, how are we going to actually make this? But funding's already in place, so I'm probably not best yeah. to answer. Um, that. Claire, can you speak to this one? Yeah, I mean, I've been involved in a fair amount of development and I think it's a bit chicken and egg, isn't it? Because before somebody's going to give you any money to develop something, they want to know that it's a good idea or that the access is in place. So inevitably, you have to do some work unfunded always. Um, and, you know, it depends on the on the project, how much. But, um, you know, the, I think there's always work that has to be done and it has to be enough to get a commissioner or a broadcaster interested enough to then put you into paid development. Yeah, I, I've just on a personal level, I've run a lot of development teams and I would say it's unbelievable the amount of work you do for free. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, it's a constant frustration. Yeah, and yeah. even when you fund a development, it's generally not enough to fund the whole development. You always end up doing bits and pieces. Um, at the moment, the, the, the advice we're always given is a great title, short paragraph, just to get our interest, but then that will, that will go to a sizzle tape, a bit of casting, a nice treatment, possibly a front page poster. So they, they, I would start, so that came from Rhys Cherm. That's a very good question. Thank you, Rhys. Um, the, the next question is, what is the best way to fund a factual piece when you're making your first documentary? Um, uh, the, obviously, Yemi, you've talked about that a lot. Daniel, do you want to talk a bit about that? Because it'd be interesting, and then maybe Yemi can follow up on that for us. Um, I mean, <sighs> The first documentary that I made were kind of in, in university, so they were, you know, you just try and a bit probably what I'm guessing what Yemi's going to say, it has to come from a really passionate place. And, you know, you, you, you want to just try, <laughs> try and do it as cheaply as possible um, to kind of get it, get it over the line. And then that's how you get, if you're passionate about something, you bring people feel that passion, even if it's a subject that's not, you know that they might not be interested in they kind of feel that because you're passionate about it and i think that goes i mean that's the only thing that i would say that goes a really long way if you know i'm sure you'd agree yemi right uh, yemi uh, where did you get where did you get your bits of seed funding from uh, your it, was, it was pretty much this is funny it's pretty much self-funded self-funded um we got a little bit of money from the bfi but the bulk of the money came from a person that I met in my NCT classes. Um, so yeah, like three years ago, um, 
before my wife was about to give birth. Uh, we had uh, weekly NCT classes in Streatham, a church in Streatham on Saturday mornings. And I got talking to one of the, the, the expected dads and he was a, a Arsenal fan and we had a lot of the same things in common. I told him about the film and he said, I, you know, He's like, I, I always wanted to invest in film. And I thought he was joking, but every time I'd see him for a drink, he'd say the same thing. So then I introduced him to my exec producer and yeah, lo and behold, he kind of wanted to invest in film and he put his money where his mouth is. And yeah, he basically helped us finish the film. Without him, it wouldn't have been finished. So that's the sort of like, you know, that is the, the glory, the beauty, you know, the reality <laughs> of independent filmmaking. It's really tough. And yeah, if you go to NCT classes, you might meet someone that has a bit of disposable income that's going to fund your feature doc. So you have, you have to be in the birthing process in some way. <laughs> in some way, yeah, definitely. I wish um, I found that story on life of birth. That would be good. <laughs> Someone's in the birthing unit asked. <laughs> um, I've got a question for you, Stephen. Someone says very specifically, this is from Mel K. And it says, how much experience do you look for in shooting APs for Race Across the World? I've only just started shooting, but have lots of non-shooting credits. Um, but that's the non-shooting AP credits, I guess. Yes, um, I, I guess, I mean, yeah, lots of non-shooting. Um, and we were looking for, uh, the thing with the, t the embed teams on race is that they have to be so flexible. So I don't think, um, normally a, a CV isn't, a be on end or I want to meet the person and just understand how that how they might fit into the team because it's those units are like really really tight have to live in, in, in each other's pockets so um I would say that the, the levels of experience probably vary across you know I've got my most experienced AP but the the, um, the, the fifth one in the you know in the fifth team is probably more like um um you know could be seen as taking a punt but like we've seen something about that person so I don't think it, there's a certain level. It's really about, you know, it's not just about shooting. It's not just about the experience in other ones. Um, so it's, will they fit in? Can I, will, will they match up with one of the PDs? So it's quite a lot of things. So I sh um, they should just, you know, give us their CV, really. Yeah. Well, there you go, Mel. Send send Stephen your CV. And um, the second question. This is a this is a re another question from Mel K. But I think it's a very good one. Um, Claire, maybe you could take this one. It's any tips for approaching contributors for a sensitive political documentary? A company is interested in my idea, but wants me to come back with access. Some contributors already willing to talk. It's the kind of thing where speaking out against the government can be risky. Thanks. So that's that's a challenging question. Um, I don't know quite how to answer that one myself, but Claire, do you want to have a go? I mean, you know, that's what, when I was a commissioner on Panorama, I used to go and meet everybody. So I would try and not do it on the phone. I would always try and meet them face to face and set aside time. You know, you're not going to meet somebody for 20 minutes. You're going to meet them for an hour or two hours. They're going to ask you lots of questions. You know, they're going to want to get to know you a little bit. And I think, you know, Dan talked a lot about this. It's about gaining people's trust. So I would focus in on one or two key people that you think would get you the commission. And I would ask them for a cup of coffee. I mean, a bit tricky in the COVID time, where, but hopefully, you know, soon enough. And um, go and talk to them and answer their questions and give them time to think about it. I think time's really important. You know, I think, you know, we expect people to say yes immediately to, to our projects, don't we? And actually, sometimes you just got to give people a bit of space, give them a bit of time and, and go back. We, we talk about it sometimes with my team about the chemistry test. It's letting people get to know you first before you're asking for anything too much. It's like letting them get a sense of rapport before you. And I think you're absolutely right. It's just keep a door open, but don't expect people to give you something when they don't even know you. Yeah. Uh, Dan, there's a question from you from uh, Kezia Shard. This is for Daniel Dewsbury. I really enjoyed The Mighty Red Car. How did you go about choosing the particular contributors' storylines that you followed and what were you looking for? Uh, very quickly, what was that? So, <laughs> so, that, so that obviously that started something completely different and then it turned into, uh, it was meant to be about young kids, then it was meant to be about old, older people who were unemployed and then it became about teenagers. And so very quickly, we, we tried to work out wh where is the drama in teenagers in a town that no one's ever heard of? 
and the drama is do they stay or do they leave that that kind of town and the love that you have for your hometown versus the aspirations that you might have for yourself in terms of kind of potentially leaving that because opportunities might be small and so that was the prism of how we went into casting every single person the apart from all the other stuff that we've said before, which is just like, do they have a good turn of phrase? Do they have, you know, emotional jeopardy going on? Is there something else going on? Is there three part, three kind of part arcs to the kind of story and things like that that we can plan out before all that apart and we, we just- I love that to... you said earlier about the little twinkle in someone's eye. It's, it's that sort of ineffable X factor, isn't it? That's totally, um, you know what, you know, that's, that's exactly right. As it's just, sometimes it's just a look or you just see someone from afar talking in a playground or kind of like, or in a supermarket or something like that. And you think you are, there's something about you or in a, on a bus, that's how we found one of the person. I was like on a bus, <laughs> on a bus in Middlesbrough. And it was just that person's really interesting, and you just get talking to them, and then you kind of think, yeah, you'd be uh, you'd be good for TV. Um, this one's I don't know. If, this is a bit of a weird question because it's uh, it's sort of more a question we should be probably asking a broadcaster, but um, that, uh, maybe Yemi, I'll give this one to you. Has any have you ever turned down a good program idea just because you didn't feel a strong connection to the subject matter? Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, a lot. I think that directing a film, making a film, like, you know, exec in a film, I think it's all, you know, it, it consumes you. You sort of, you live with this project, you live with the characters, you live with the subject matter for so long. So I feel that, you know, there might be good ideas, but you perhaps might not be a good fit for, for those ideas because of, you know, because you might not feel, you know, strongly about the ideas. You might think, oh yeah, you know, someone will, do a better job at making that, but perhaps I'm not the person. And I, I just feel that, yeah, you, you can't be disingenuous. You, you just have to be really honest and, and, and just say, you know, perhaps that it's not, it's not for me. I, I've done it plenty of times because I think that, yeah, you know how hard it is to make an hour of television and, 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 and how much goes into that and, and to make a series and it, it consumes you and you live with it for so long. So I kind of feel that if you don't have a strong connection with it, because, you know, just because you don't have a strong connection with it doesn't mean that it's not a good idea. It just means that you perhaps you're not the person to make it. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I've turned down stuff before. Excellent. Good. good. I think that's true. You, you have to give a lot to a programme. So if you don't really like the subject, it's good to move on, isn't it? Um, Claire, uh, I've got one final question for you. Well, it's actually I'm going to put two questions together and then afraid guys we're going to have to wrap up I'm being told to wrap up but Claire this one says I am a runner from Dublin and interested in the editorial side of factual and entertainment and thinking of making the move to London would you advise on this and then there was another one which is a general advice for anyone starting a career in factual so if if well Claire answers the one about Dublin can everyone think of a one-line answer to their key bit of advice that they would give before we wrap up Frankly, I don't want to be responsible for somebody, you know, <laughs> in the pandemic. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I mean, there's lots of work in Dublin, there's lots of work in London. Um, I made the move many years ago, but what I would say is I started as a runner um, in the uh, Ulster Television newsroom, delivering scripts to the gallery, getting shouted at a lot, making a lot of tea, you know, and, and I did that for three or four months um, and then I got a break. So, you know, everybody's break comes somewhere. So just keep at it. I don't think it matters what city you're in. You know, I started in Belfast, I went to Dublin, then I came to London. Um, you know, I think just stick at it and opportunities will come your way. I, I guess generally speaking, now more than ever, there's a big move to move programming, the makers, the money, the funding to tell stories about the whole of the country by people all over the country. So you don't have to come to London to work in TV is a, probably a very important message we should be yeah, putting out there. And I think the pandemic has made it even more possible to work, you know, remotely some of the time. And, you know, you know, you could be anywhere. Uh, especially if you work for Stephen on Race Across the World. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Stephen, what, any, any final top tip that you have for the youngsters approaching the word, world of factual? Um, I think um, Claire's already said it really is patience. I mean, it's just you've got to, you know, the more experience you get, the more saleable the skills will be. Um, and you, um, you know, there will be people that will listen to your ideas early on, but it's going to take a little while for um, people to believe in you because there's a lot of people trying to get in. So I just think patience, um, you know, um, 
and and just keep on learning. Actually, keep on learning. That's a better. That's a better one. Because I mean, I, I've been in it, at it for thirty years, and I learn every day still. So, um, Dan, any any top tips? Uh, one top tip was someone said to me that instinct whispers it never shouts and it's something that has always stuck in my mind as in because sometimes there's just something inside you that thinks oh i'm going to do that i'm going to make that move i'm going to take that shot i'm going to ask that person and that has always kind of um served me well that's a fantastic phrase i've, I've literally written that down um yeah you hear me um, um, I would say just be persistent and, and be curious and, and, and don't be afraid to be forthright. If you're watching something at telly and, you know, and, and you like it, like make a note of the production company, the director, the producer, and, and then just look for them and, and then send them a nice email. I think we all like having our egos flattered. And I think that, you know, you, you don't wait for opportunity to knock, go and, go and find it, I think. Yeah, I, I'd like to sort of just throw in, you know, sounds really obvious, but work really hard. <laughs> I, really, I love a grafter, don't you? Yeah, and also definitely. try and be nice. Being kind yeah. and nice is really, can never be under overrated, can it? Um, be a good person. Um, anyway, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you, to Claire Hughes, Stephen Day, Yemi Bamira and Daniel Dewsbury. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, really enjoyable. Uh, before we say the final farewell, uh, I've just got to give a quick plug to some upcoming events, um, uh, Guru Live Sessions. There's a case study on Rocks, one of the this year's standout film releases with members of the cast and creative team on the 24th of November at 5pm. That should be fantastic. Please book in for that. Then on the 25th of November at 6pm, the final TV session is on Sky original drama Bulletproof, featuring on-screen talent and creators Noel Clark and Ashley Waters. So um, those are both sound like really great events. Please do book in for them. Thank you to the panel again. Thank you for everyone who stayed with us. Uh, it was a really great discussion. Thanks all. Bye. Nice Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care.